This sermon is brought to you by Christ Church South Philadelphia, a church that is committed to living out the gospel in their neighborhood and from there impacting the world. For more information about our church or to support our mission, you can go to www.ChristChurchSouthPhilly.org. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please open to the book of Judges, book of Judges chapter 4. If you need a Bible, you can just shoot your hand up. We have someone in the back who'd love to be able to give one to you. We'll make sure everyone has a copy of God's Word in front of them today because that's what we believe the Bible is. The Bible is not just a storybook. It is divine revelation through which God shows himself to us. And we're in a series in this book of Judges uh, that we're calling Breaking the Cycle, Rebellious People Pursued by the Faithful God. We're going to be in Judges chapter 4 this morning, and as you turn there, I, I wonder who here has ever seen the movie The Parent Trap. See the movie The, the, the Parent Trap. We actually have two options. You have the, the original version with Hollywood legend Haley Mills, and you have the more modern version, Lindsay Lohan. Although I looked it up this morning, and I realized I'm revealing my age by calling that one the modern version. Uh, it is over 25 years old now, and so I just feel really really old. And, and my kids are like, yeah, that's because you are old. Um, but in the modern one, <laughs> there's this line that strikes me. The, 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 the husband is asking his daughter's mom, so his ex-wife, why did you leave me? And she says, well, I wanted to see if you'd chase after me. I wanted to see if you'd fight for me. Now, on the one hand, that's terrible relationship advice. <laughs> Like, that's not what we tell anyone here when, like, they want to get married and we're doing, like, premarital counseling with them. Like, we don't say, here's what you should do. Create tests to see if the person really loves you. Like, that's a terrible way to do a relationship. No, you should give yourself 100% to each other uh, fully all the time. So that's bad advice. But on the other hand, don't we want to be fought for? <laughs> I mean, when you're young and someone's picking on you, didn't you want someone to stand up for you? When someone did you wrong, didn't you want your parents to fight for you? Or maybe you didn't have parents and you wished you did so that they could fight for you. In some ways, don't we want to have friends who fight for us, who, who have our back? And yes, if we're married, in some ways, don't we want a, a spouse who will fight for us? There's something about being, feeling loved and cherished and valued in knowing that someone is willing to fight for you. As we come to Judges chapter 4, the big idea of this text is that God fights for us. God fights for us. Whether you've had parents who have fought for you or not, whether you've had a friend who has fought for you or not, whether you've had a spouse who has fought for you or not, I think God wants us all to know this morning, you have a God who fights for you. You're not alone. You might go through hard things in life. You might have to endure some battles, but you are fighting battles that God has already won, and your future is secure in him. And so I've tagged this text, God fights for you. God fights for you. And how we're going to go through the scripture this morning is that instead of me reading it all up front, I, I want to kind of actually take it section by section. So read a few verses, comment, then read a few more and comment. We're going to do that as we work our way all the way through chapter 4. And then we're also going to be pulling in some verses from chapter 5 because chapter 5 uh, is, is a poetic song about the events of chapter 4. And so there's certain things in chapter 5 that help us understand even more what's happening here in this story. So please keep your Bibles open and follow along. We're going to start with the first three verses of chapter 4. This is the Word of God. And the people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sesra, who lived in Harash Hagoim. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. <laughs> For he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. The chapter starts with, once again, the people of Israel getting caught in the cycle of rebellion against God. When it says that they did evil, we, we've already been told in chapters 1 and 2 and 3 what the evil is that they keep doing. They keep turning to false gods. 
Right? They would go through this cycle where God didn't do what they wanted God to do when they wanted God to do it. And so instead of just trusting God and continuing to be obedient to him as they waited on him, they tried to take things into their own hands and turn to different gods who would give them what they want. They had these false idols that they would chase in an effort to bring control to their lives. And for us, we don't necessarily have temples and idols that we'll go and chase, but can't there be so many things that we can look to and be like, well, well, this will be it. Th- this is the help I need. And we go and we try to take things into our own hands instead of trusting what God says we are to give into his hands. But as a result of their actions, the peoples whose idols the Israelites worshipped end up becoming their oppressors. It says that God gave them over to the Canaanites. Did you see that? It doesn't say the Canaanites conquered them. It says God gave them over to the Canaanites. Now, this is not God being spiteful. This is actually God being very merciful. Because when there's something in your life that is harming you, but you think it is fine, the most merciful thing that God can do is show you how wrong you are. And so the first thing we need to see from this text is that God fights for us by using pain to turn us away from that which is harming us. God fights for us by using pain to turn us away from that which is harming us. There is an extremely rare disease called congenital insensitivity to pain and andro- uh, androidosis. I might be saying that wrong, so I'm just going to call it by its acronym, C-I-P-A. I am not a doctor. I just play one on TV. But what happens with people who have C-I-P-A is that their pain-sensing nerves get disconnected from the part of the brain that receives pain messages. And so people with CIPA cannot feel pain. And that might sound great, but is in fact very dangerous and in most situations, deadly. Have you ever accidentally brushed up against something that was burning hot? You feel that pain and you immediately remove yourself from it. Ouch, that hurts. But someone with PI, CIPA could just stand there with their hand on a burning skillet and not feel it. Since they don't hurt, they don't turn away from that which is doing them harm. And very oftentimes, they'll end up dying as a result. You see, feeling pain is a vital part of experiencing protection. Sometimes God allows us to experience The pain of our choices, our sinful choices, not because he is unkind, but because he is kind. And he wants to protect us from that which is harmful to us. And so he brings pain in our hearts, not to get back at us, but to bring us back to him. Now, I'm not saying that all painful things that we go through in life is because we've done something wrong. We certainly live in a broken world. And sometimes pain is just a byproduct of this place being messed up. But we do need to have a category that our pain could be God trying to get our attention. That's certainly what he was doing here with the Israelites. And during this painful time, God raises up a woman named Deborah. Our story continues in verse 4 through 5. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lebedoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. So there's this lady, Deborah, and she would sit under a tree. And you know you're doing well when you have a tree named after you. And so she would sit under the palm of Deborah, and people would come to her and ask for her judgment. Like they would have issues going on, and they'd be going to her and saying, hey, what should we do? But Deborah would not just give them her own wisdom. No, verse 4 says that she was a prophetess, meaning she had someone who was empowered by God to speak the words of God. And so she did not give her own words. She gave the Lord's words. And so in the midst of this faithless nation going through a painful time, we have Deborah who was being a faithful woman. She was being led by God's word even when most people around her weren't. But notice what Deborah's faithfulness is leading her to do. She, she's not sitting up on the hill looking down on everyone else and being like, you're all so messed up. Why can't you be more godly like me? 
No, Deborah was following the word of God, and that was leading her to share the word of God with whoever was willing to listen. See, true godly character and maturity always expresses itself in humble service towards others. True godly character and maturity always expresses itself in humble service towards others. True godliness does not lead us to thinking we are better, but instead seeing how we can help other people come to know God better. And the second thing that we see here in this text then is that one of the ways God fights for us is by using other people to speak his word to us. One of the ways God fights for us is by using people to speak his word to us. We need godly people in our lives who are following God and can help us do the same. The Christian life is not meant to be a life that is lived alone. We need the help of other people. We need other people who are following God who can then speak God's word into our lives and help us do the same. And so I just want to ask you, who are your Deborahs? Who are your Deborahs? Who who are the people you can go to that you know will faithfully speak the word of God to you? Like, Like this is who we want to be as a church, right? This is why we have our community groups Right, which we're do, even doing this week, where we get together in smaller groups in our home, in our home, so we can get to know one another. We we want to be a church that's committed to building relationships with each other, not so we can just be a social club, but so that we can speak God's word into one another's lives. Because part of how God fights for us is through having other people speak His word to us. We need to have Deborahs in our lives. And one day, Deborah calls this man Barak to come see her. We read about this in verses 6 through 7. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abdomom, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Is not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulon. And I will draw out Sesra, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river of Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. She says, Hasn't God told you? Right? We're not told when God spoke this word to Barak, but apparently Barak had gotten these instructions and then just sat on them and did nothing about them, was disobedient to what God had been telling him to do. But before we give Barak a hard time, we need to appreciate what he is up against. Verse 3 tells us that the Canaanite army had 900 chariots of iron. As we've already discussed Throughout this series, chariots of iron, they keep coming up because they were the ultimate military technology in that day. Like when you have iron and everyone else around you only has wood, you have quite the advantage. And so it's like, it's like the Canaanites, they had Apache helicopters and the Israelites only had BB guns. That's essentially what the situation was. And not only did they have these iron chariots, but the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that this army had about 300,000 foot soldiers. And so Sisera's army was the most advanced army and the largest army in the world. And chapter 5, verse 8 tells us that Israel had only 40,000 people. And out of all those people, there was not a shield or a spear to be found. So it's not hard to see why Barak would be a little hesitant to go to war against these Canaanites. He, he is taking into account their strength. And he is looking at his limited resources. What he had been called to do was simply just too much for him to do. But what he had forgotten was that God never gives us a command without also giving us the promise that he'll go with us and empower us to keep his commands. Right, verse 7 says, and I will draw out Sisera. And I will give him into your hand. Who's the I that's talking about there? That's the voice of the Lord. This is God assuring Barak that he's going to go with him. He's going to give victory to him. And and God had promised these things to Barak. And it was God's promise that should have given Barak courage. You see, the life of faith is a life that allows us to be honest that we have limits. It allows us to be honest that we can be weak. It allows us to be honest that what is against us is just too much for us. God never tells us to downplay how hard things are, but he does ask us to trust him no matter how hard things are. 
The life of faith is a life where we can be honest about our limits, but not limited by our limits. Because we believe that we have an all-powerful God who's on our side. Barak didn't believe that, though. And we see that his unbelief comes out even more in verse 8. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Now, some people want to try to get Barak off the hook here by saying, well, this is an action of a faithful man. He's asking Deborah to come with him. And Deborah was a prophetess, and so he knows the Lord is with her. And so this is him saying, I want the Lord to come with me. However, that doesn't take into account several things. And I'm, I'm, I might sound like really convoluted, but I'm telling you that's actually what a lot of people are trying to say because we have a hard time recognizing that in the Bible, sometimes the heroes are not actually that heroic. And Barak is not that heroic. And so one, it doesn't take into account that like, wait, why would he be so concerned about, well, if Deborah comes with me, the Lord will come with me. The Lord already promised he was going to go with him. <laughs> and it also doesn't take into account what comes next in verse 9. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road in which you're going will not lead to your glory. The Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Now, what we have to understand about this is that in ancient Near East culture, it was an honor and shame culture. And so nothing was more valuable than your own glory. And so Deborah saying that the glory is not going to be yours is like her saying, you just lost your job. You just got demoted. You, you just took a pay cut. Like a person reading this in the ancient world would realize, oh, Barak just got rebuked. Barak is being corrected at this point by Deborah. Well, what's amazing to me here is that God loves Barak so much that he's not willing to just let Barak stay in what is wrong. Like God could have just moved on from Barak, right? He could have just moved on and used someone else. I mean, last week we saw that he used a farmer with a stick to deliver his people. It's not like God needs to use Barak. He could have found someone who was willing. He could have found someone who was going to be obedient. He could have found someone who was a whole lot more courageous. He could have found someone better than Barak. But God loves Barak so much that he's unwilling to move on from him. And what we see in this is that part of how God fights for us is by not giving up on us or holding on to us. Part of how God fights for us is by not giving up on us, but holding on to us. Friends, our God is a God of steadfast love. Those whom he has set his affections upon, he never lets go. And I don't know about you, but that's my testimony. Like, that's the only reason I know that I'm standing here right now. If it had not been for God, I'd have lost my faith a long time ago. But because his grip on me is stronger than my grasp on him, because his power to hold is greater than my capacity to struggle, because his love abounds over each and every sin, it has been through many dangers, toils, and snares that I have already come, and t'was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace that I know will lead me home. See, God holds us friends. God holds us. This is our story. This is our song. And this is what we should be praising the Lord for all the day long. God brings Deborah into Barak's life because God still wants to use Barak. And so Deborah gives Barak the correction he needs to hear. And it's her correction that then leads him to change. He says, I will go. Only if you come with me, but I will go. And so he's moved. He's still having struggles. He's still being timid. But he's moved from complete disobedience to timid obedience. And so Barak is certainly not all of who he should be. But at the same time, he's not also who he used to be. And this example like that that honestly give me hope for myself. Because it illustrates how God often changes us by degrees. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says we are being changed from one degree to another. Like, we can't really tell the difference between a change of one degree to another. I can't tell the difference between 75 degrees and 76 degrees. But I can tell the difference between 75 degrees and, 55 degree, and 85 degrees, or 55 degrees and 75 degrees, right? God sometimes works in big temperature changes and changes us drastically in a moment. But often how God works is slowly, just degree after degree after degree. Small turn after small turn after small turn. And we need people in our lives who can help us make those turns. 
We need people who are willing to walk with us in patience and help us grow degree by degree. Deborah is actually very patient here with Barak, isn't she? Like, he should have been fine to go without her, but she actually says, I'll go with you. That's, that's a sign of patience. She's meeting him where he is at. She's not excusing his sin. No, she says, hey, you're not going to get the glory like you should have done what God told you to do. But she says, but I'll, I'll still go with you. Like, so she meets him where he's at, but she doesn't stay with him there. No, she helps move him along. She, she helps him continue to grow. She, she helps him grow with a commitment to patience and partnership. There is no doubt for Barak, is there here, that Deborah is on his side. I mean, she's going into battle with him. And so one of the ways that God fights for us is by people kindly correcting us. It's by people kindly correcting us. And I use that word kindly very importantly because I think sometimes we, we just want to correct people and go around and point out all things that are wrong about them all the time because they annoy us. But that's not kindness, that's arrogance. So often we, we correct because we, we just don't like what someone is doing and it's bothering us. But the reality is, friends, we don't get a vote, vote on other people's choices. Like, do you know that? You don't get a vote on other people's choices. But God does. God actually gets more than a vote. God wants to shape our lives. And so we should correct, not when we're being annoyed, but when we see our Christian brothers or sisters not following Him. I'm so grateful for people in my life who lovingly correct me at times. And I'm not just talking about, you know, being criticized. Like, it's not helpful to be criticized. Like, it's just not, there's, there's no use to that. But when you know someone is for you, when you know, like, they're going into battle with you, like, they're not moving on, they're not, they're not leaving you, they're not, like, there's no rupture in your relationship. Like, they love you, and they're for you, they're on your side, they're with you. When, when someone like that brings correction into your life, man, that's a voice you need to listen to. And, and notice what she's doing here to Barak. She isn't just coming down on him, she's actually trying to lift him up to be faithful to be the man has called him to be. Right? She's not saying, you're such a terrible person, I've had enough with you. No, she's saying, hey, let's go obey God together. Man, we need to listen to people like that. Because part of how God fights for us is by putting people like that in our lives to kindly correct us and to help us make those turn by turn by turn, degree by degree by degree, change that we so often and so desperately need. So Barak listens and they go into battle and we pick up what happens in this battle in verses 12 through 15. When Sesra was told that Barak, the son of Admon, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sesra called out all of his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from Haresh Hagamai to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sesra into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sesra and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of his sword. And Sesra got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And so this Canaanite general, Sesra, he hears that, that Barak is rallying an army against him. And so he goes and gets his army, his massive 300,000 foot soldiers, 900 chariots army. He gets his army and he goes to take Barak out. But instead, his army, the largest and most technologically advanced army in the world, Sisera's army gets routed. In chapter 5, verse 4, and also verse 21, help us see why. Verse, source, verse 4 says, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched down from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. Verse 21, the torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, march all my soul with might. See, here's what's happening. Sisera's army goes out to fight, and as they come against the people of Israel, a storm comes down, a torrential downpour. Now, now we need to understand, this is not like our part of the world where we can just get storms that come up like out of nowhere all of a sudden. No, this is Israel. In Israel, there are very clear dry seasons and very clear stormy seasons. And this battle was taking place during a dry season. How do we know that? Well, we know that because no general in his right mind would take a bunch of chariots of iron into battle knowing that there might be rain. Because chariots of iron are really heavy, and they didn't have mud tires back then. And so 
what was often a strength would become a liability because they would just get stuck. And if they got stuck, you know, then they were just sitting ducks. And so, you know, this must have been during one of the ten months of the dry years and not the two months of the rainy season. And yet when God is on your side, it doesn't actually matter the season. The Lord opens the skies, and a torrent of waters comes down, and the strength of Sisera's army was actually turned against him and became a liability to him. And we shouldn't miss this also. Remember a few weeks ago when we looked at who the gods were that the Canaanites worshipped? Do you remember the god Baal? Do you remember what he was the god of? He was the god of the storm. The Canaanites worshipped Baal because they thought Baal controlled the reins. But here we see the one who is really in charge. The strength of their iron chariots and their god of storms was nothing before the one true God. The very thing that oppressed them, the very things that, that Israel had been experiencing so weak and helpless against, God actually used that weakness and turned it into a, a way to show his strength. See, one of the ways God fights for us is by taking what is weakness in us and using it to display his strength. One of the ways God fights for us is by taking what is weakness in us and using it to display his strength. I don't know what's in your life that you feel like is holding you back right now. I don't know what in your life is making you feel weak. Maybe there's mental illness that just sometimes clouds your mind. Maybe there's a disease that just gives you so much physical limitations. I certainly know what that is like as I continue my three decades long battle with Crohn's disease. <laughs> Maybe you're someone who's just, you, you have a propensity to fear. I, I don't know what you would say is your weakness, but here this says who God is for us in our weakness. God is a God who is not limited by our inabilities, but through his power he can take that which we think is holding us back and use it to actually set us up for him to move in a powerful way. The Canaanites are defeated. But Caesar escapes. It's meant to be a little ominous. He escapes, perhaps to go rally more troops, perhaps to go fight another day. He, he escapes. And we read what happens as he escapes. Verses 17 through 18. But Sesra fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Canite, for there was peace between Jamin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Canite. And Jael came out to meet Sesra and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And just to warn you, things about to get crazy up in here. There was this man named Heber, and he had made a peace treaty with Sesera, with Jabin, the king of Canaan. And so he, he was an Israelite who had made peace with the enemies of Israel. We're meant to see that that is a wicked and sinful thing to do. And yet our God is so amazing that he can take crooked sticks and use them to draw straight lines. Our God is such a God that he can use even sin to accomplish his salvation. You see, Sesra goes to the tent of the man who he thought was his ally, and he's met by his wife, Jael. But unbeknownst to Sesra, Jael had not followed her husband into his sin. Just because your spouse is doing what is wrong does not mean you should follow them. You should always be on their side, which means that you should always be on God's side, and sometimes that might mean that actually what they're doing, you're against. And so Jael has not followed her husband into his sin, and we see that because she invites Sisera in. And remember what Deborah said about who would kill Sisera? When we first heard it, we thought, oh, she must be talking about herself. Well, maybe that's who she thought she was talking about. But this is really who God's going to use to deliver his people from this evil king. Verses 19 through 21. He said to her, please give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent, and if many man comes and asks, is there anyone here, say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him 
and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. Caesarea goes and he asks for some water, but Jael actually gives him an upgrade. She gives him milk, right, which is more valuable than water. Milk also makes you sleepy. So Caesarea takes a little nap because he's being treated well and he thinks that he is safe. But then Jael takes a tent peg, which would have been a big wooden stake. She takes that peg and she grabs a mallet and she drives that stake through his head and into the ground. And the next sentence is so obvious that I think the writer of Judges is actually inserting it for humor. Because it says that like she drove her into the ground and he died. It's like, was that really necessary? Like, yeah, okay, pretty sure that he's dead. You know, that, that's usually what happens when you get a stake driven through your head into the ground, you know? I mean, I think there's several times in the book of Judges where the writer's like, man, this is just so crazy. I gotta say something funny here because this is just nuts, right? I think that's what's going on. We're meant to chuckle a little bit. Sometimes things get so crazy, you just, have to, you, just have to, you just have to laugh, right? This man is dead. He's killed. He's killed by the hand of jail, the hand of a woman, just like Deborah had prophesied. We should notice this as well. Chapter 5 goes on to give us some further details about what is happening here. I actually wasn't sure. I was debating back and forth whether I should include this or not, but uh, I don't want to trigger anyone, but, but I do think these act, this is actually meant to be healing, and it's in God's Word for a reason. Look at verses 24 and through 27 of chapter 5. Most blessed be of woman be Jael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg and right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sestra. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet... He sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet, he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. Notice what keeps getting repeated. Between her feet, he sank and fell. Between her feet, he sank and fell. And I think we see why this gets repeated in verse 28, where we get this poetic picture of Sisera's mother and what she's wondering about what, where her son is. It says, out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera, wailed through the lattice, why is his chariots long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Sisera's mother is wondering here, why is not back from Balfour yet? Why is he delayed? Now, if someone's delayed, and you know them, and you know what they're doing, then you probably have a good idea about why they are delayed. Like, like, if I'm delayed coming back from, from, from work, Angie does not assume that's because something broke here in the building and I'm trying to fix it. She knows me too well for that. I'm not handy at all, and so whatever problem there exists, I'm just going to make it worse. And so, so she sees that, like, hey, Jeff said he'd be home at 530, and he's, it's getting late. What's going on? She doesn't assume I'm fixing something in the building. She assumes that someone showed up, and I'm talking to them. Uh, because I like to talk, and so I'm a talker. And so she's like, oh, he's just caught up in a conversation again. Okay, let me just turn that dinner down on simmer, right? And so she, she, she knows me, and so she knows the things that can delay me. Sister's mother knows him. And so what is it that she assumes that is delaying him? We read in verses 29 through 30. Her wisest princesses answer. Indeed, she answers herself, so she's, she knows it herself. Have they not found and divide the spoil? A womb or two for every man. Spoil of dyed materials for Sisera, spoil of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed wool embroidered for the neck as spoil. Sisera's mother assumes he's delayed because he's dividing the spoil of his victory the dyed wools that they had captured, the clothes. But not just the clothes. He says they're dividing the women. And doesn't even call them women. He calls them just a womb. Sister, his mother, assumes he's delayed because Sister and his men aren't done yet with assaulting the women that they had captured. Because that's what he did. That's who he was. This is a wicked man. 
But what we're meant to see here is that God had not turned a blind eye to the pain of his daughters. No, he gives the honor of killing this wicked man into the hands of one of his daughters. And this man falls at the feet of a woman. I think through this we are meant to see that God sees, God knows, and God cares. If you have suffered abuse, I think God just wants to speak this into your heart. Your pain has not gone unnoticed. God sees. God knows. God cares. And God fights for us by ensuring justice to us. God fights for us by ensuring justice to us. If you've been wronged, you need to know that there will be a day of justice either in this life or the next. God loves you too much to just let it go. Which actually is meant to give you freedom that you can let it go. You don't have to keep dwelling on what's happened to you in the past. You might have been seriously and significantly wronged. God's certainly not asking you just to move on and get over it. No, He wants you to know that He will bring justice. And so you can entrust your hurt to Him. God will fight for you. So you can be free to move forward, knowing that you don't have to fight for yourself. God will take care of it. As we come to the end of the story, we should notice that at this point, there's something unique about this story. I really the story that we've seen so far in this book and that we're going to continue to see usually center around one central figure, one central judge. You know, again, we've seen a judge is also someone who's a rescuer. But here we see that there's three. And which of them is ultimately responsible for Israel's victory? Well, without Deborah, Barak never goes into battle. But without Barak, the battle never gets fought. Yet without Jael, the enemy general never gets killed. What we're meant to see, they are all playing a part, an indispensable part in this victory. None of them can say by themselves, I did it. But what they can all agree upon and what we are meant to see is that ultimately, God did it. <laughs> right? This is what verse 15 clearly says. It says, and the Lord routed Sisera. This gets repeated in verse 23. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. Again, this is what verse 3 and 4 of chapter 5 says. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I'll make melody to the Lord God of Israel. Why are we singing to him? Because verse 4, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched down from the region of Edom. See, the victory came through people, but we're meant to see that, that it, it's not the people's victory. It's the Lord's victory. It is God fighting for his people, and he fought for them through the faithfulness of Deborah, through the repentance of Barak, and through the courage of Jael. And we know that each of these judges, each of these rescuers, are meant to point us forward to the ultimate rescuer, Jesus Christ. Each of these people are a foreshadowing. They're a, a sneak preview, a little appetizer of the true and better Savior who is to come. Jesus is the true and better Deborah because he not only spoke the words of God faithfully, he is the Word of God. In Jesus, God's Word, God's revelation took on flesh, John chapter 1, 14 tells us. He's the true and better Deborah. He's the true and better Barak because he was never reluctant in his obedience, but submitted himself fully and always to the Father's will. Jesus was obedient no matter what was against him, even when it led him straight into the cross. He was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And it is at that cross where we see that Jesus is the true and better Jael because it's at the cross where a stake is driven through our enemy, the enemies of our sin, Satan, and death. And that stake is driven through our enemies by Jesus allowing nails to be driven through his hands and feet. It's at the cross where Jesus took all that our sin deserved and experienced the judgment of God that would take us in eternity to experience in hell. It's at the cross where we see we have a God who's willing to fight for us to hell and back. And friends, we need to know that the God who has fought for us 
is the God who is still fighting for us. Because our Bible says in 1 Peter verse 1, chapter 1, verse 5, by God's power, we are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Our Bible says in Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. God's word says to us in John 10, 28, that no one will snatch Jesus' sheep out of his hand. God's word says to us in Jude, verse 24, that he is able to keep us from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Our Bible says in Romans 8, 39, that I am sure that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depths nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, God fights for us through Jesus. He fights for us through Jesus. He he fought through Jesus for us on the cross, and he is still fighting for us through Jesus today. And that doesn't mean that everything is going to go our way. That doesn't mean that there won't be battles that we have to face. But what we need to know is that every day that we wake up to a battle is a day where we are not battling alone. The God who fought for us is the God who is still fighting for us, and his victory is sure. And so while your life might be imperfect right now, that's just because your story is unfinished. The God who fought for you on the cross is still fighting for you, and he will continue to fight fight for you, and he won't stop until he brings to pass the great and glorious day that he's promised in Revelation chapter 21 where he says to us that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away and he who was seen on the throne said behold I am making all things new God has fought for you and he is fighting for you and he won't stop fighting for you until Christ comes to make all things new. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, friends, this is meant to give us hope, even when things are so dark. This is meant to give us joy, even in the midst of things that are so heavy with grief. This is meant to secure our peace, even when we're surrounded by chaos. No matter what is happening around us, friends, we have a God who is fighting for us. And man, that should fill us with some praise. If you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I'm just so glad, so glad that you would be here. I don't think it's by chance that you're here to listen to this today. And God is inviting you today to know that there's a love that is fighting for you. It's his love. Today is the day where you can stop fighting alone. But if you would just put your faith in Jesus, you can know that God is on your side. And so whether you've been a Christian for decades or whether, man, you're actually going to become a Christian for the first time today, our application of this text is really all the same. Look to Christ. See God fighting for you in Jesus and live in the good of that love. Inspire heads in a word of prayer.